Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our webinar series, Embracing Change. Happy New Year for those I haven't spoken to personally. And um, thank you for coming back and uh, having us, giving us the honor and privilege to be here to share. And I hope you took some time off with family and uh, maybe it took some time to catch up on some of the webinars we did last year. Well, we're going to start the year with somebody who is from Australia, but actually presently in quarantine in China. So Vinay, lots of experience, Gestalt therapy, written a book, lots of spirituality. And uh, we're going to talk about the family field and how we move maybe from entanglement to flow. So welcome Vinay, thank you very much for taking the time. I know it's late for you um, in, in China. I guess not that late, it's seven o'clock. And, um, and so let's, let's begin with what, what does the family field even mean? Like what is that and why does it matter? Welcome Vinay. Sure, well I appreciate being here and uh, talking to you about the subject which is certainly one of my favorites. I guess before we talk about the family field, it's good to talk about the field. Um, so the field is a way of understanding life. That's a very big word. And uh, the way that people, just to generalize for the moment, normally think about their experience tends to be quite linear. So for instance, linear causality, you know, um, my wife yelled at me, so I'm you know, sad, that seems a, a fairly straightforward cause and effect relation. From a field point of view, you could also say from a systemic point of view, nothing's linear. Everything is not only interconnected, but circular. So, you know, my state engenders whatever I'm doing engenders my wife's mood, which, you know, feeds back and you get these feedback loops. It's the idea of cybernetics, the flow of information that's interactive and we feed into each other's realities. So in that sense, you know, no man is an island. Uh, certainly I have my own individual experience and yet there's so many ways in which my experience is connected to and contextualized by many layers of what's around me. So in Gestalt therapy, which is kind of what I come out of, when we talk about the field, we're sort of talking about everything really, the life, the universe and everything. The field is the interconnectedness of everything. And of course, if you keep going, it sort of gets very cosmic or very spiritual, but that gets a little too abstract or ungrounded for you know daily life or for doing therapy or for understanding how to live in a family. So what we look at was, is we look at different facets or different levels of the field. So we can talk about the family field and obviously that consists of immediate family and then it also consists of extended family and then it consists of intergenerations of family. That's all part of the layers of context for our family field. Um, and then there's other aspects of fields we can talk about, you know, the economic field, we can talk about the social field, the cultural field, the religious field, all these fields impact us in different ways. That's, you know, incredibly clear at the moment with the global field of coronavirus, which is creating a context in which, you know, everybody's highly influenced by that on all sorts of levels, economically, interpersonally, physically. Um, so, looking at the field, as I say, it can get very abstract because, you know, it starts to get very complex and everything's connected to everything else. So the trick with looking at fields is to not get lot too lost in that complexity. You know, you can just keep following the rabbit hole down and, and it's fascinating, but in the end, it's not that useful. Um, so what's important is to kind of narrow our focus to what is, what aspects of the field are particularly relevant to whatever the particular situation that I'm facing is. So that's what, what we do in therapy. We kind of pick the particular issue that the person's wanting to deal with, and then we look at what is the field that contextualizes that, or we could say that the different layers of the field. So that's a, a bit of a broad introduction. And so within that, we can talk about the family field. So um, some people may be familiar with the work of Bert Hellinger, um, which I'm also going to refer to because he's one of the sort of major exponents, you could say, of the field and understanding the field, particularly the family field. Um, and I've certainly learned a lot from him 
personally, his writings and the practices of family constellation, which he developed, were now called systemic constellations. So um, th there's a lot that I came to understand about myself and my own family and my own dynamics. So um, the, just to explain for people who haven't encountered this, um, the, the family constellation process basically replicates the family field. So we invite the person who's the client to select some rep people to represent different elements of their fields. So they might rep pick their mother, someone to represent their mother, their father, their sister, their brother, their uncle, their grandfather, important people in their field. And then the, the people in the circle who are representing those members, um, the client will take them and will place them sort of you could say geographically in relation, you know, the father might be facing away, the mother might be very close to the children, whatever the configuration is. So then the client sits down and then we kind of look firstly and you can literally see the family field in front of you. It's quite extraordinary. And sometimes the client will talk about a particular problem that they start with. And just looking at the structure of the field, you go, well, you know, of course, you're going to have that problem. Look, look at the way the field's structured, you know. You've got the mother too close and the father too distant. And naturally, you're going to be torn between closeness and distance in, you know, your marriage or something like that. So um, just understanding the structure to begin with is very useful. And Hellinger said many things. One of the things, <clears throat> and he drew a lot from this idea of, in therapy, <clears throat> excuse me, in therapy, it's called structural family therapy. So that, that is you, you do therapy with the family by looking at the structure and changing the structure. So that was one of the things that influenced him. He's a fascinating guy. He, he um, was originally a Catholic priest and he went to Africa to work with the Zulus. And um, he was there for 25 years. And I always say, the Zulus converted him because at the end of those 25 years, he left his priesthood. He went back to Germany. He married, he studied psychotherapy and he developed this thing called family constellations, <clears throat> which really imbibes a lot of the sort of spirit of the, the Zulus, you know, their understanding of community and connectedness and ancestors. So um, I'm, I'm describing this particular process of family constellations because it kind of helps us understand many things about families in the family field. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll, I don't like talking too much theory. I'll look, talk about a personal example to start with. <clears throat> so my field, my family field is you know, complex like everyone's. Each field is so unique. That's the really interesting things. You know, people's family fields may look similar, but just like each individual, each of our fields is incredibly unique and has its own dynamics and its own history and its own tone. A bit like, you know, if you walk, if you've got three different shops next to each other and you walk into each of those three shops, <clears throat> as soon as you walk into a shop, you'll immediately get a feeling, you know, people are bright and cheery and they come up to you in a very friendly way. In another shop, it's kind of, you know, people are a bit somber and, you know, instantly you get a feeling for that field in the shop. You know, we can read it just naturally. And so each family feels like that too. You step in the field and you get a particular experience, you know, because the nature of fields is that, let's say the field is more powerful than the individual. That is, as much as we, you know, hang on to a sense of this is me and this is what I believe and this is what I want, you know, this is my identity. Fields are incredibly powerful and we, we easily become kind of inducted into a particular way of being by virtue of the field, even if it's in reaction to that field. <clears throat> so, um, so back to me. So, okay, I'll, I'll tell you a few things about my field. Um, so my father, my parents are both American, both from Los Angeles. So they're both born in the 1920s and um, <clears throat> Jewish family, 100% Jewish. So my parents, um, they, you know, were, came of age, mid 20s uh, in, their, in the 1950s. So of course in America, that was post-war McCarthyism and the beatniks, you know, that generation. So 
they were influenced by that. And my father, who was a very kind of free thinking kind of a guy, um, he and my mother, you know, they were into the beatniks. They, they listened to Alan Watts and they were into jazz and, um, you know, they, they were sort of progressive minded people and very much, um, you know, concerned about the McCarthyism and the anti-communism that was very strong in the US in the 1950s. So uh, my father was this independent thinker. So he, he went to um, the UK to finish his PhD where I was born. And then he came back to the States and he just didn't like what was happening in the US. He, for instance, he, he was a researcher, a scientist, and um, I think in labs. And he noticed, he took a Geiger counter home and he noticed that the, that the radiation kind of came home with him. And then he noticed that there was radiation in the air fallout from some of the atomic tests. And he reported that to one of his superiors that he you know, was concerned about that. And he got a visit from the FBI. So, you know, he, he was kind of like really questioning what was happening in American society at that time. So he moved my family, myself and my sister and uh, my parents moved to Tasmania, <laughs> Hope that Tasmania, which is about as far away from Los Angeles as he could get. You know, he, he wanted to eschew materialism and all the, the big, bold values that Los Angeles represented. So that's where I grew up was, you know, a little quiet hope about Tasmania with this kind of very free thinking father and mother and in a climate of sort of intellectual, you know, questioning and such. So that's a little bit of my family field. So obviously, you know, this is going to influence who I am. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm sort of American, but I grew up in Australia. So I was always a bit of an outsider in a sense. Um, you know, I never really quite understood Australian culture. And so that experience of being the outsider <clears throat> has stayed with me. And although it was very painful when I was growing up, now it's become kind of a part of how I relate to the field. So here I am traveling internationally, teaching everywhere. And, you know, I'm always an outsider in a sense. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy. I, I get to be the person who encounters different cultures and discovers different cultures and so <clears throat> my position in the field as the outsider I've made work for me so that's kind of one you know parameter of what we can do with our experience in family fields because you know they shape us profoundly and so we can take it in a direction which is kind of vibrant and um, enlivening or of course it can become a trap and you know it can become depressed about being the outsider and never being really fully in with the group. So that's <clears throat> part A. So I'm going to tell you part B because that leads into the, the family constellations and the issue of entanglements and such. So when, um, when I was 23, my sister developed schizophrenia, my mother got cancer and um, so there's a whole lot of upheaval happening in my family. And then my mother died when I was like 24, 25. And then I got married, had a baby. And then a couple of years later, my father, to the surprise of myself and pretty much everyone else in his life, came out as a transsexual. So there's a hell of a lot happened in that short space of time that you know I spent many years trying to digest. So um, over the next sort of 10 years, I was practicing therapy and such, and I was trying to figure out how to come to terms with my father's transsexuality, because whilst I'm, you know, liberal and progressive and, yeah, you know, great, he's being himself and being authentic, and I'm really happy for him, then or her, um, at the same time, it was kind of, I was unsettled because, you know, my father had become a woman who didn't want to know about really his past and literally wanted to cut it, cut off his maleness. And yet that was my father. So, you know, although it was liberating for him, her, you know, I had to figure out how to integrate all these sort of different elements. So um, I was kind of troubled by it for some time because my father wanted me to just instantly accept her as a full-blown woman and kind of really never talk about the past. That would have been her ideal sort of scenario. Um, but, you know, that 
didn't quite sit for me. So I went to my first family constellation and um, set out my family in this, you know, interesting configuration that it, it is. And um, the facilitator kind of, um, you know, did, did some adjustments to the structure to what we say, you know, in, increase the flow of love. Yeah. That's the idea of Hellinger, that love flows in families and sometimes that flow gets blocked and then you yeah. get entanglement. So they, they did some adjustments and, and eventually um, they kind of put me face to face with my father, Elaine, that was her female name. And they gave me a line to say that was just a beautiful line that just sort of integrated everything for me. And the line was, um, you're my father, you'll always be my father, and I bow my head before your fate, you know. So that was just, you know, everything in me just kind of like, oh, you know, I can, I can recognize that this is who you've become or this is who you are, this is your fate, this is the direction that life has taken you and you've chosen. I can fully embrace that and I can also recognize that, you are my father and you'll always be my father. No matter how many dresses you wear, you're still my father, you know. So that was just a wonderful settling. And I felt so, I don't know, a lot of the anxiety and troubles and kind of tension that I felt up to that point just sort of landed, you know. So that's a, a kind of a bit of an example of moving from a position of sort of kind of some entanglement, you can use that word that I think is a quite good word in families, to a position where more love can flow. You know, I'm more settled, I'm less anxious, I can find a place for all these different elements in my field that were couldn't quite fit together. So I'm able to be more present and more connected. You know, it didn't we didn't live happily ever after. <laughs> my father's a complex person and kind of difficult in in him herself, but um, I certainly felt a lot more settled after that. So I'm telling this story, taking up our time to tell my personal stories, to, to try to illustrate some elements of um, what happens in families and the kind of, you know, the way entanglements develop and some of the possibilities of moving them. Now, you don't have to go to a family constellation workshop necessarily to do that. <clears throat> if you understand some of the kind of underlying principles, it can be very helpful. So Hellinger, um, I'm quoting Hellinger quite a bit here because, as I say, I think he has a very profound understanding of the dynamics of systems and families. He, he mentions two principles that were at work in what the facilitator did for me. One principle is the principle of the weight of time. So what this says is that the people that we've known the longest and have been in relationship to the longest have the most weight, have the most significance, the most seriousness for us. So according to that principle, of course, our parents are the people that we've had the longest relationship with. And so they're always going to have more weight than any other relationship in our life. No matter you know, how fraught those relationship with the parents might be, there's a certain kind of gravitas, if you like, that exists because it's the longest relationship. So it, the weight doesn't mean that it's it's um, that's not a weight in a bad sense. It's a weight in the sense that they have substance, if you like, yeah. simply by the passage of time, no matter what happens within that time. So that's one principle. And within that principle, the outcome of that is I always need to acknowledge and honor the weight of time, the weight of those relationships. So you can see, for instance, in a first marriage, in a second marriage, I'm in my second marriage. Although I've now been married in my second marriage for 20 years, the relationship I have with my first wife will always have more weight, even though, you know, I talk to her once every six months now or something like that. Nevertheless, the relationship with her always has more weight simply by the virtue that it's older in time. And that produces a complication in families that are um, step families, because you see, when you look at the reverse side, the weight with my, the parent of my, you know, the, the, the mother of my children, the relationship with her comes before the children. So the relationship with my first wife will always have more weight 
than the relationship with the kids, simply by virtue of this time issue. Um, what happens in a blended family is that my second wife comes along and the relationship with my kids has been longer than my relationship with her. So that produces difficult dynamics because I don't have the natural weight of the relationship of, with my first wife, you know, that I had in that marriage, 13 year marriage, that relationship had more solidity. With a step family, it's always because the relationship with the kids has this pull, the weight of time always has pull. Okay, so that's the first principle. Now, the second principle is equally true, Hellinger asserts, and I agree with him, and it's pa completely paradoxically opposed to the first principle because the second principle is newer systems must take priority. So if, for instance, you know, there's the weight of the relationship with my parents and... Um, then, you know, I meet my first wife and I get married so that that new system that I form with her must take precedence over my relationship with my parents. Otherwise, that relationship with my parents, it has all that weight, just keeps pulling me back, pulling me down. And that produces entanglements if I let that happen. So um, when, when I was traveling around the world with my first wife and I was 24 and she was 21, and went to Canada where she's from and we were spent some time there and then we left Canada to come back to Australia and she found it incredibly difficult to say goodbye to her family there's that full of the weight of the family and I almost felt guilty like what am I doing you know taking her halfway around the world back to Australia that's where I met her um so <clears throat> I felt a bit troubled by that but you know I'm like well I don't know this is what we're doing and if we're going to She's going to come with me. So she did. And, you know, we made a, a good life in Australia, had three kids. You know, I'm very grateful for that. So, um, you know, the, our relationship had to take precedence over her relationship with a family of origin. And, and that was good that that happened. And that kind of needs to happen. <clears throat> so newer systems must take precedence over older systems. So you can see how these two core principles are kind of paradoxical because one's pulling us, one's acknowledging the pull of the past, the other is acknowledging the movement into the future. And unless you have both of them balanced in the right way, something goes wrong. So I'll give you another personal example of mine. So, okay, I get remarried. Wonderful. Now my, my second wife has two children. So now we've got five children, we've got a Brady bunch. And in fact, my, my, current wife my second wife was the preschool teacher of, an, of a couple of my kids and my kids went to the same school so you know it's very much we're in the same sort of local field and so there's a lot of connectedness so um so five kids so i'm i'm a sort of a fairness guy and my version of fairness is you know i treat everyone kind of equally and i took her children as you know being my children i really just completely took them on 100 percent so as far as, as far as I was concerned, now I had five kids. And so, you know, I treat all the five kids kind of equally. However, that produced problems because at that point I didn't understand this principle, you see. So my kids felt miffed because, you know, from going from being my kids and special and, you know, they had my attention and now there's like two more kids that they've got to share attention with that I'm now, you know, I'm treating these stranger kids, so to speak, with equal value to them. And they felt like, you know, what gives, you know, we're being sort of overlooked. And in a sense, it, it was kind of true because although I was following the principle of prioritizing the new system, I wasn't respecting the weight of the old system, which is, you know, a common mistake, especially in blended families. What would have worked better, as I now understand in retrospect, and what my current wife had advised me to do at the time and I wasn't listening to her was to do special things with my three kids to special them you know I didn't want to family, but in retrospect that would have been good because that would have been honoring the weight of the old system and that principle is true also with the first wife and a second wife or 
you know, first husband, second husband, whatever the situation is. So Hellinger says that things flow better when the first wife says to the second wife says to the first wife, not necessarily actually says, but, you know, in her heart, um, you came first, I came second. I'm here because of you. You know, that's like a really honoring of the way rather than trying to, you know, push it away or cover it over or resist it. It's like really honoring the weight of that relationship because Hellinger says, if you honor the weight of your, you know, these longer relationships, then they sort of, they have their due and you can follow the principle of prioritizing the new system. But if you're too keen, like I was, for the new system, then the old system goes, ah, 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 ah. you're know, disrespecting us and, you know, and although the Brady Bunch was lots of fun and delightful uh, for a number of years, when the kids all became teenagers, all just like, ah, you know, teenagehood is difficult enough. But teenage blended family, yeah, there was some pretty challenging dynamics that, you know, I take some responsibility for because I, I didn't understand fully, you know, how to let love flow. So you see that's this principle of, you know, there's certain ways to do things in families that allow love to flow and certain things that create entanglements. So I'll say one more thing before I shut up and we can actually have a conversation, <laughs> um, which is to do with uh, another thing that Hellinger talks about, <clears throat> which is the exclusion. So for a range of reasons, people and families get excluded. <clears throat> so um, it might be because they've done something wrong or it might even be because, you know, they're a perpetrator or it might be because they've got some kind of mental illness or, you know, all sorts of reasons people get excluded from families. They become alcoholic or they do something the family doesn't approve of. <clears throat> they differ in their belief system, whatever that is. So, Exclusion can, of course, happen very explicitly. People are, you know, banned from family gatherings or etc. cetera. Um, and, of course, that's very painful to a family. It's certainly painful to the persons being excluded. It's painful for other members who might be connected with that person. Hellinger says, though, that there's other ways the exclusion can happen. So, for instance, um, if, let's say, a, a child dies... Um, you know, very young or something, then sometimes the way people deal with the, the grief is that they don't deal with it. And particularly perhaps in more olden days, that might have been the case where people just, you know, don't talk about it. It's like, and, and even <clears throat> children are kind of not allowed to go to funeral or, you know, that person just sort of disappears from the family, so to speak. And that disappearance is what Hellinger calls a kind of exclusion. <clears throat> Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat today. A bit more water. All right, take a drink. There's no incredible, incredible sharing, my friend. Maybe it's the throat huh? <clears throat> expressing, expressing things and clearing out, as you know better than me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Indeed. A so, bit, a little um, bit of resistance in the body huh? as you express yourself. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. So <clears throat> I guess that's my, um, you know, these are momentous things I'm talking about, of course. Yes, of course. So, um, yeah, sure. No, I always like to share my own experience. So when exclusion happens, it's, it's dangerous. It's very much dangerous to families. And as I say, sometimes people aren't aware that what they're doing is exclusion. So um, one of the dynamics of systems is that of family systems is that when someone's excluded, then often <clears throat> that person will be remembered or represented by someone else in the family, usually the next generation or even, you know, the second generation. So that's where you get strange things that happen in family. A, you know, a child is raised in a kind of loving household and doesn't seem to have any particular trauma. And then, <clears throat> they like, yeah, become an alcoholic or something. And it almost doesn't make sense. It's like, what's going on? But when, especially if you lay out the, the system, the field, you know, in this kind of 
geographical way where you see all the, the elements and the representatives, then you can start to see that sometimes there's like a correspondence. So, you know, the, there's the child that strangely becomes an alcoholic and then you start to see that there was an uncle that was killed in war and, you know, his brother, another uncle, you know, was distraught and could never deal with it. And, and he became an alcoholic and then you're shunned by the family or, you know, that's a very obvious example. And you actually see these correspondences. So you can see it in the, the system because you'll see that the, the client without awareness lays out, like they might put themselves here and then they'll put that, you know, uncle who died, they'll put them sort of like directly facing them at a distance or something. You can start to see the lines of connection. So what's relevant here, one of the things is that, you know, we have to pay a lot of attention to this issue of exclusion um, and how it happens in families and, you know, how it can be dealt with because um, to whatever degree we do that, whether out of awareness or, you know, out of reaction or something, it can, yeah, have a, a really poor effect on families. And then sometimes it might have happened in a previous generation, but it's still going to influence us or our children. So, yeah, there's lots of fascinating things that you can discover about the field. And um, by looking at family fields in this much more kind of complex way, in this vision of interconnectedness, then we can start to understand both what's going on and we can understand perhaps some of the things we can do about it, whether it be usually it's more like an internal change, a change of attitude, or maybe, you know, putting up a picture of the grandfather that's never talked about, or there's little things that can make, just shift the field and start to, you know, shift the whole field and, and allow love to flow rather than the entanglements to sort of tie everyone up. So that's a, a brief introduction to a very big <laughs> subject. <laughs> With lots of sharing. Taking thank you. Lots okay. of time. No, no. Thank you, yeah. Vinay. That was really incredible. Really, thank you for sharing such a personal story. And obviously your throat is um, clearing through whatever resistance exists. But uh, I want to take that maybe a little step further. I mean, please, everyone, um, ask questions as we go. Um, this is going to be an incredible another 30 minutes together. Um, so now you have the space. Okay, here you talked about an, a former wife and a new wife. Then you know, my you know one set of kids, another set of kids, and all of that. How about when the parents, the parents of a divorced boy, you know, son or daughter, right? How, how what what advice would you give them between, like you said, you know, the two ends of the of of the time of the old and the the new? What would you recommend them I mean, their parents right now on the webinar who are, you know, about to experience and will be my parents as well? What would you what would you advise them? How in, in terms of, of of working with that? And they'll be having well, I mean grandkids, new Yeah, grandkids, sure, you know. Granddaughter pa parent, that's right. Parent parents might have, you know, the situation where they've got the the previous daughter-in-law and the new daughter-in-law and that's right how do they balance that because again the, the weight of time is on the side of the previous daughter-in-law and then the, the new daughter-in-law is sort of the you know Johnny come lately and you know how do they cope with that so um, you know you can certainly keep in mind these principles that the the previous relationship the previous you know the first daughter-in-law that relationship needs to be honored and the the fact that, you know, she came first needs to be respected and um, that she's not just sort of forgotten or swept out of place. You know, we always need to honour these older relationships in some form or another. And then at the same time, recognising that the system has changed and that the newer system has to take precedence. So there has to be a little bit more priority to that system. And so... You know, for instance, the parents might have a relationship with that first daughter-in-law that maybe it's a close relationship, you know. So it, it, then it becomes a, a balancing of that relationship and acknowledging the new one. Now, the, the, the older daughter-in-law, you know, is probably going to have all sorts of feelings herself about this. That's where it starts to get very complicated. And, you know, people start to take sides and, you know, that, that's inevitable in family systems, of course. Um, 
However, the, the more we can step back and look at that bigger picture and understand the operation of the larger field as compared to just, you know, my particular perspective, um, the more it's possible to see things in terms of field dynamics. Now, this is a way of thinking. I've, I've given a couple examples um, and I also talked at the beginning about circular causality. So thinking about fields requires us to think in different ways, in non-linear ways, in interactive ways, in co-created ways. And of course, what often happens in human relationships and certainly in families is that there's certain portions of blame, you know, well, this person's to blame for this situation. You know, I've told the parents might say to the their son, let's say in this case, you know, I've told you, you know, if you didn't pay enough attention to your family, you know, you'd lose it. And there you go. You've lost your family. And, you know, and you've just jumped into another relation, you know, lots of opportunities for blame. And of course, we all know that that doesn't work very well, um, <clears throat> tends to make people defensive and such. So obviously, you know, a simple and basic principle of any human relationship is to find a way to move out of blame into a different kind of connection. So that's not always easy, though. So one way to do that is to step back and look at the bigger picture of the field. Because when you look at that bigger picture, then, you know, I can start to see perhaps how I'm connected in with, you know, the son who's left one marriage and gone to another and ignored the first wife and, you know, she's got sick of it, whatever the particular story is. I can start to see that maybe that's kind of connected with me and maybe it's not just because of him or him having the affair or, what, you know, whatever it is. Sure, those are the, the facts, the, the litany, the surface story. I can start to see that underneath that, there's all sorts of other connections, including, yeah, what it is that the way I've been involved. Maybe I pulled back and didn't say anything, or maybe, you know, I, I didn't say anything, but I was disapproving in the background. All sorts of things that I can look at if I'm the parent in that situation in myself. And so that helps move away from buying into a, a bit of a greater responsibility because that's another element of systems is that everybody in the system has some responsibility for the maintenance and construction of that system and even people who rebel from the system in a sense you know if they're in reaction they're still kind of part of the construction yeah. of a system in which they've rebelled and left so you know nobody escapes responsibility in a system and that's both a kind of can be a burden it can also be something that's kind of liberating because if i understand that the system which seems to be going on over there and it's you know to do with my son and what can i do somewhere somehow i'm connected to that and that gives me an opportunity to look at myself and to be interested in myself and you know how how it is that i've entered into the system in a particular way that's perhaps not completely faultless and i think you brought up you brought up something very important is that just because we don't say anything doesn't mean it's not impacting the system right by not speaking is a choice yeah and by mm -hmm. feeling like yes, you said exactly. the whole i mean i know i went through the whole process of of blame and shame and and even though there was politeness mm -hmm. there was complete respect kindness mm -hmm. but at the end of the day mm -hmm. the unspoken the blame and the shame hadn't been you know moved through or spoken about and as soon mm. as that mm. started to happen, the impact on the children was night and day, right? And, yes, and that's right. And these are some of the things that, you know, many of us in the older generation maybe want to say, I mean, I'm not that old, but anyways, that, you know, feel that if we abstain, it's, mm. it's okay. But actually, mm. that's, still a, that's still a position you're taking. So let's move from, from, from the family, spousal, in-laws, et cetera, and mm. go to, let's say, a, what we prefer to use generational continuity, most people mm -hmm. would use succession planning, right? Now, mm -hmm. again, it's, it's kind of the same thing where the patriarch or matriarch is letting go of the reins to have their son, their nephew, their daughter, their niece, whoever it is, take over, mm -hmm. right? Well, it's actually continuity, mm -hmm. but they look at it kind of mm -hmm. as a perception of takeover and mm -hmm. succession, right? Which triggers a lot of mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the things that you're talking about. 
Now I know it's kind of similar, mm. but is there something that you would mm. you would advise? Because there's advisors um, that are that are watching us up. Some of our practitioners, some of them you know, obviously as mm. part of genetic care. Mm. Is what what would you kind of guide to go through in that in that situation? What would be your mm. um, recommendations or just you know thoughts? Sure. Well, obviously there's a lot of layers and complexity of that too, because you're now not just talking about the family and its dynamics, you're talking about basically business and dynamics and the, the interconnection between a business and a family. So that adds layers and layers of complexity. Um, so yeah, right now you're talking about succession, which includes the, the transfer of power and decision-making. That's one facet of it. Um, however, you, it's also important to um, address the issue of money because you know within that there's a sort of an inheritance process someone's inheriting an asset you know um and so with that asset comes benefits or you know it, it represents value in some sense including financial value so there's a, a very good little book that i came across uh, a long time ago called the seven laws of money by i think um, michael phillips or something i don't know if you're familiar with it it's a very useful book because it's written from a, a really systemic point of view. And one of the things, for instance, he says, is that you, you, you never actually lend money and you never actually borrow money. He said, what, what happens is you change the relationship. So the, the money is completely abstract. What actually changes is the relationship you have with someone. So I think that that's you know, one lens that's kind of useful to understand. He says the same thing about inheritance. That's why I'm raising this because he says, an inheritance is never just a kind of an independently parceled bunch of money or a house that just, you know, cleanly gets passed on like a, a package, you know, <laughs> that with no strings attached. He said, no, an inheritance is always profoundly embedded in relationship and that you, you can't understand the inheritance or what it is without understanding the relationship, even if it's a silent relationship, even if nothing's said it's still a relationship and the, the, the wishes and the personhood of the, the, the one who, you know, gave the inheritance has incredible impact, emotional, practical, on all sorts of levels. And unless you pay attention, you notice the dynamics of the relationship and you notice the dynamics of the expectation and you are able to locate yourself within that, that is basically going to be potentially quite, you know, destructive or damaging because you're going to pull against the how the relationship contextualizes that particular inheritance process. So whether it's a child inheriting the family business or certain wealth or stocks or whatever that is, all that becomes a part of it. So inheritance is not just someone dies, it's, you know, the passing on of, of wealth, obviously, and assets. So that's one thing that I think requires a lot of attention. And it means that we have to really look at what is the nature of the relationship with that person and, you know, what are the expectations they have and not, not just explicit expectation, but sort of embedded expectations. And where does that land us in a relationship? So then I think that requires a lot of support, a lot of awareness and um, preferably a lot of dialogue. And dialogue is sometimes difficult under these circumstances because, you know, th this is very sensitive um, subtle dynamics of the field and people don't always have the skills to articulate that, to name that. Um, it, it appears like, you know, I'm handing on a business to you, but, you know, it, it's a lot more than that. And obviously the relationship between a child and a parent has a lot of layers of comp complexity, whether it's a fantastic relationship or whether it's a terrible relationship, that all is an inherent part of this. So I don't think you can talk about any kind of succession without attending to that. And, you know, you can look at <clears throat> terrible examples like Gina Reinhardt and her kids to see, you know, where things can go just profoundly wrong, you know, where there's zero attention to relationship and, you know, all that wealth, which could be so empowering or so wonderful or so, you know, just just be so good for the world or good for the people even that inherit it, it just becomes poisonous, you know, and they, they live out these kind of, you know, nightmares really because the relationship hasn't been attended to. So I guess that's one thing that I'd say in general, of course, there's a lot more that 
you know, we could focus on about particular examples and how you'd manage those relationships. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is that I mentioned in relation to that is the transfer of, of the business. Let's talk about that aspect. So businesses are also fields and they're also systems and they obviously have their own individual contours as well that to some degree are a reflection of the person who started them and then they kind of get a life of their own just like families do. The business field is slightly different though because um, like, and we also do constellations, the same process we can do it with a business, with, with an organization. It's fascinating because you lay out, you know, the different people and in whatever related to the particular problem you've got, you put the boss there and the vice president and, you know, the workers and you start to see, you know, how the system's configured. You start to see the entanglements. You start to see where there's flow and, you can make it, in family constellations, what you do is you sort of, you actually move people around to improve the structure and increase the flow. The difference though, is that um, in, a, in a business, in an organizational system, obviously there's not the blood ties. So people can leave that system. Whereas in a family system, in a sense, people can never leave it because that proves a principle of exclusion, you know, who belongs to the field belongs. And, um, when someone's in a family system, they always belong in some way. Whereas when someone's in a business, they belong out of technical relationships, but not, you know, obviously on that necessarily deeper sense. Although some of those relationships in the business field can have a lot of weight in time. So now you start to see some of these principles in action, because let's say, you know, there's the father, okay, let's say, who's developed this factory business or whatever, and he hands it on, let's say, to the son, just to use that simple example. Um, so the father, you know, maybe has whatever, a vice president or something who has been his right-hand man or right-hand woman, whatever. And, you know, maybe came in early on and, you know, helped steer the company. And so now the father's moving away and the son's coming in. But you see what's going on, you know. The, the weight of the relationship of time that the father has with that VP is always going to be more than the son has because, you know, yeah, sure, we've got to have the principle that the new system has to take precedence. But you, know, you can see how easily the weight of that relationship the father has with the VP can pull the VP in the direction of the father rather than allowing him to evolve in a new direction, in a new system. It may be very difficult for him to do that. So you can see the same principles of honoring the weight of old relationships and you know giving precedence to new system operating. And so a big issue with succession is, okay, this is a new system. You know, how, how is it possible for the people who were in the old system to give precedence to the new system? And there's a lot of you know, resistance to doing that because people have these relationships that are older in time. So how you balance these two things, you know, of course, that's kind of the issue. I can only sort of, in a sense, enumerate the principles without having specific examples of that. So, so let's, let, let's get granular for the, for the practitioners and mm -hmm. advisors, right? So obviously, as, as patriarchs and matriarchs, people are writing letters of wishes, right? And, and mm. some of them are, you know, when they come to us, we actually request them to, to, to read it at the family meeting. So that mm. way it's, you know, mm. why not live it out while you're alive rather than post your transformation? Absolutely. Right? And mm. um, so what would you add to that? And maybe what would you add to the pre prenup process, right? In terms of trying to kind of reduce the entanglement or potential entanglement or pain and suffering. I'm not talking about making different choices here. I'm just talking about mm. kind of, you know, clearing the way or making it a little smoother. I know life is still going to be bumpy and juicy and all of that. Mm -hmm. But would there be any things you you would add to that from your from your perspective in terms of letter of wishes? Oh, sure. There's a whole lot. I mean, in, in a in a more ideal scenario, yeah. Let, let's just use the father and the son. I'm I'm using two males, but let's just use that for now. Um, the father gives his wishes. Okay, he's. Um, that's the weight, you know, of the old system. And um, in an ideal scenario, the father would 
give these wishes and then he would acknowledge explicitly you are now the new system and <clears throat> I know that your direction and your wishes are going to take precedence over mine. So he would acknowledge the new system. Okay. And then ideally the son would say to the father, I acknowledge that, you know, the system is here because of you and that these are your wishes and that um, this is, and I, I, I honor what you've given to me because that's what you're handing on. I, I honor the history, you know, the, your wishes, although they might be for the future, are still an extension of the same system. Yeah. So the wishes are actually part of the history. So, you know, I, I honor the history. And although I might do a thousand things differently, I'll always honor that history. So, you know, when both people kind of honor each other you get the most ideal scenario where things can flow um, of course you know if either side is reluctant to do that then you know that becomes problematic you know the son is reluctant to honor the weight of that system because he feels like it's going to pull him down you know the father's reluctant to give precedence to the son because it means that there's going to be this transformation that's going to be, you know, unsettling for him because the thing that he's created is going to be possibly turned upside down. So, you know, if both people are able to feel centered and really um, offer a kind of a dignity to that process, then it can potentially go well. Now for both people to do that is not such an easy thing. And usually people need support, you know, and you, you come in or your advisors come in to support that process, which is fantastic. So in a constellation process, the support might be, you know, that I stand behind, let's say, the father while he's acknowledging the son and I put my hand on his back just, you know, so he feels the support. Or I might put his father and, you know, his father in a line of men behind him. So he feels the support, you know, he feels the connection with the past and he feels that he's supported, that he doesn't need to hang on to the sun because he feels the support behind him. And then the son can see that line behind his father and that he doesn't have to take care of his father and, you know, just please his father or compromise himself because he can see that his father in a sense is connected with that lineage. And then, you know, I, in the son statement, I'd go behind the sun and put my hand on his back. So he feels the support to be able to stand as part of the new generation, stand in his own light, stand in, in symbolism of the new system and feel the capacity to honour the old and move into the new. But he needs a lot of support for that. He needs someone there, me, or he needs to have a sense of, you know, who is in the field. Maybe it's a you know, a, a favorite aunt or whatever that is, someone who's standing by him and he can feel the support of that. So support's a big factor in each person being able to stay centered in themselves and honor each other. So that's, you know, one thing that I'd say I think would be very helpful. Now, that would be incredible, right? I mean, so rather than just reading out the letter of wishes, you add this process, which I think will bring mm. complete different energy to the process, because like you mm. said, there's a lot of push pull, right? And there's a lot of, mm. you know, um, knowing and, and fear, right? Uncertainty, it's, it's, mm. it's, 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 it's a balance of the two. And I think now going to, let's say the pre prenup, anything, now, now let's not, I'm not talking about complex families, whatever, even if it's, let's say as you know, the first, um, first marriage, no children, what, 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 what would you advise in terms of looking at maybe some things that we don't look at before. So you're talking thing. about, let's say someone really with, you know, a family wealth and someone else coming out as a, a, a man just to keep this consistent, marrying a woman who's coming into the family system. That's what, like an example you're talking about, right? Yeah, but okay. I was talking about generally man, woman. I, I didn't mean whether there's wealth or not. I mean, to me, okay, I know, but I just, I need to sort of, you know, okay, narrow sorry. it down to a yeah, okay. example. Obviously okay, it might be a, might be a girl who's inheriting, you yeah. know, a lot of wealth from the family or she's in a family yeah. who's wealthy and, 
you know, there's the the adventurer with, you know, <laughs> no assets who marries into the family, sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's very complex, obviously. Um, I certainly think about the, the issue of power dynamics because, you know, the girl, let's say it's the girl, um, she has a lot of power by virtue of the wealth of the family. And let's say this guy, the adventurer, you know, is out around the world, but, you know, doesn't have any assets. Um, he comes in with, you know, relatively less power. So in any relationship, certainly any marriage, where there's a significant power differential, then it's very important to address that power differential quite explicitly, I would say. So, I mean, obviously the best way is to, to be able to talk about it and to look at, given there is a power differential between us, like that's just a fact, you know, how are we going to address that? How are we going to be two people who are equal partners despite this power differential? So then you need um, a lot of attention, I think, both on a technical and emotional level as to how to transit from a situation of this to this, that that's, I think, the fundamental issue. You know, the prenup is, I would say, predominantly for the purpose of moving from this to this. You know, how, how do we achieve that within this context of money, wealth, complexity, inheritance, etc.? cetera? So, um, you know, obviously there's structural things. So for instance, just to move, use a different example, like I've got a friend who's um, a very experienced therapist who's, you know, got, got a beautiful house in the United States and he's got a well-developed practice. And then, so, you know, if a woman marries him, unless she's got something equivalent, you know, she's coming into, you know, a, a, a situation where there's a power differential. He's got a beautiful house and the hills and all that kind of thing. So, you know, if a woman comes into a situation like that, she comes into his house, you know, she comes into his wealth. So there's got to be some way to even it up. Now, that might be that no matter how beautiful his house is, no matter how attached he is to it, he's got to leave that house and they've got to build a house together, you know. Or perhaps, you know, he's got the house completely furnished with all these beautiful things he's collected from around the world. Well, he's got to let that go because that's the weight of the past and give precedence to the new relationship. And she's got to be able to entirely furnish the flat or they furnish it together, you know. So that, th those are some kind of metaphors in a sense. What are the things we're going to do to even up this power differential? You know, joint bank accounts, obviously, are a significant one, you know, so that and that's true in a marriage where, you know, there's a, a, an income earner and a homemaker in whatever gender configuration. You know, if the, if the income earner has the accounts then obviously that maintains a certain power differential. You know, that income has to go into a joint account and both people feel ownership, equal ownership of it. So the homemaker doesn't feel less ownership just because they haven't earned the money. You know, that's a way to even up the power differential. So we have to look for all the ways, like cover all the basis of how do we shift this power differential. And sometimes it's very, very difficult. Sometimes it's hard because... You know, there's all that weight of the wealth and the guy comes in with nothing, you know. So how does he even feel that he can deserve, in a sense, that wealth? And then it, it becomes part of this issue of like an inheritance. In a sense, he's inheriting some wealth and then he's in relationship to the person, the family through whom that wealth is coming. So there needs to be a lot of attention, not just to the him and the wife, but him and you know, the source of the wealth, where that wealth's coming from. Is it, does it become her wealth or is it still kind of owned by the family? Then he's in relationship to whoever it is that's located in the wealth until that, you know, becomes them, his. So in a sense, it's likely to be more successful if whatever wealth might be handed on is in sense given to the couple as a couple, you know, because as long as he's the kind of, sticking on the end of it you know he's always going to be in this one down position so i think you know prenups in a sense need to take into account the risk involved of 
the risk of not doing that, you know, if you hang on to the wealth and say, well, if we spill up, you know, you, you'll get a few crumbs. That's not really going to support the system. There has to be a willingness to kind of risk capital um, by, by making it jointly owned. Now, I realize that's a big risk and people are very reluctant to take that risk. And yet, without that, I think you're maintaining a power differential, which is, I think, going to work against the couple in the long run. All right, Vinay, you're not going to believe it, but it's already an hour. And, uh, it's wow, been... that went by so fast. <laughs> either, either everybody is in awe or not able to follow you or still trying to catch up with what you've shared, but uh, we'll give them the benefit of the doubt that they're in awe of all the sharing, all the personal stories, which I'm really, really, truly grateful for. And, um, and, and bringing some, I was expanding, you know, in terms of how generational continuity or how you know, the concept of, of prenups and, and broadening it because it isn't most many times this, it's, it unfortunately stays a lot more like that. Mm -hmm. And I think that mm -hmm. people like yourself would be really an asset. And, you know, that's why we're excited to, to do things together as, as, as we are in terms of being part of the genetic care team to bring a different element to that process that we haven't been thinking about, you know, really looking at you know, the, the, like you said, the, you know, the, the system, the, the entanglement, the flow, and, and to make that process a lot smoother, because as you know, the success rate, unfortunately, is not in our favor. So before we go, um, some, last, some last words you'd like to share um, that people can reflect on and, and, and think about before uh, we all continue our, our day. And obviously, you begin to begin your, your night um, in, in China. Mm. Well, I, I hope that um, what I've said has perhaps inspired people to be interested in learning more about systemic dynamics. And, um, you know, there's a lot of materials around these days. There's so much in the internet that's very accessible. Um, yeah, so I encourage people to look into that more. I certainly encourage people to read Hellinger's books. I've derived enormous benefit from reading them and understanding myself, my family, system dynamics from that. So, um, yeah, I'm hoping people take away some kind of inspiration to expand the way that they think about themselves, their families, their businesses, their lives, to um, be able to encompass, encompass greater complexity because that's what a field view does. It allows us to hold complexity without needing to reduce things into kind of simple reductions. You know, we can hold the whole picture, we can hold an understanding of the whole family. And by doing so, we, our interventions, our responses are going to be more integrated and more holistic. Yeah. So thank you very much, Vinay. Thank you for that. Um, what, I will, what I will do is I'll request Jamie to coordinate with you to send out, as we send the video, the books that you refer to, um, Seven sure. Steps of mm -hmm. Wealth and uh, the other books that you mentioned that whoever is keen can continue the learning process mm. through that experience. And um, so thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're going to be back starting again next week um, with Barbara, um, who's just finished her book. And we're going to talk about relationships. And the week after, we have Peter Vova coming back talking about family offices and family philanthropy and the connection and the leveraging of the two um, off each other. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for being here. See you next week. And again, thank you, Vinay for your time, the honor and privilege, and really the sharing that you did authentically. Truly grateful. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, everyone. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Bye.